Good afternoon, our friends and family, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, Wartime Diplomacy Briefing and Analysis, Day 166 of the Hamas-Israel War following the October 7th mass murder by Hamas of between 12 and 1300 Israelis. We are honored today uh, to have Professor Alan Dershowitz, the, the Felix Frankfurter Emeritus Professor uh, of Law from Harvard University, one of the most prolific authors on the American scene in the last 50 years. Uh, and uh, before we uh, get into a deep discussion with uh, Professor Dershowitz about U.S.-Israel relations in crisis at this critical moment, we're going to turn to our dear friend, Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Maurice Hirsch, Senior Fellow at the Jerusalem Center, just to give us today's uh, contextual brief as to uh, the uh, the assault profile that has taken place today on day 166, Maurice. So yes, Dan, uh, really dividing up into three different main areas. Gaza, we've had we've seen intensive fighting in the Gaza Strip in the Khan Yunus area with Israel attacking um, not a small amount of terrorists, predominantly working around the Al Shifa Hospital. The terrorists again using the hospital for cover, knowing that Israel is very sensitive about going into hospital. In Lebanon, what we saw today was an attack by the Israeli forces on a Hezbollah chemical weapons depot, um, really that had been placed in the civilian uh, and urban surroundings to use the civilians as the human shield in the same way as Hamas does, so Hezbollah does in Lebanon. Um, this morning we had a, um, a, really a, a different incident where we had a ballistic missile shot, most likely by the Houthis, towards Israel's south, landing outside uh, um, of Elat, um, Israel's southern port. That's really the update on those three areas from each side, Dan. Seeing intensive fighting, the attack from Israel from all directions, south, east, north, every way around. And you know what the transition is, uh, Maurice, we'll, we'll turn to Professor Dershowitz, is that the more that the United States pressures Israel or even appears to pressure Israel not to defeat the Hamas, the more violence and subversion is invited by the Iran-backed uh, 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 proxies. Professor Dershowitz, how do we get our hands or arms around the, the, the tremendous sense of bewilderment and concern and even fear in the Israeli body politic that Hamas and the uh, Muslim Brotherhood-centered Qataris are now building a port, which our Egyptian friends have called us this morning and said, my good, what the devil is going on here? That threatens Egypt as much as it threatens Israel. Well, first, thank you for having me. I wish I were talking to you at happier times. Uh, and I want to make one correction. Please don't call Al-Shifa a hospital. It's a hospital. And that's the term that has to be used. Uh, these hospitals have been taken over by Hamas uh, with the help of uh, Doctors Without Borders, UNRWA, um, other United Nations and other, quote, humanitarian. Uh, and they're home hospitals and they are appropriate military targets. Israel has the obligation to be sure that it takes actions in a way that limits the number of uh, casualties. But remember that the rule of proportionality is not a rule that says that Israel can't kill uh, a million uh, combatants in exchange for one Israeli soldier. They can. The only rule of proportionality under international law is when they strike a target that is both a mixed target of civilians and military, the value of the military has to be proportional to the number of potential civilians that could be injured or killed. And Israel lives by that principle, and Hamas uh, does not. And so it's essential to uh, for the world to understand that Israel is operating within within the rule of law. The other point that is very important to make, based on what you said earlier, the only reason this war continues is because of the Biden administration. If the Biden administration had stuck to its initial policy, which was good, which said Israel is the right to defeat Hamas, Israel is the right to destroy Hamas, Israel should, of course, take all precautions to avoid civilian casualties, but if there weren't the Chuck Schumer analysis, if there weren't the Biden implicit threats of possibly cutting off uh, military supplies unless Israel complies everything, 
That's what encourages Hamas to go forward. Hamas at the moment is winning this war. That is, they killed 1,200 Israelis, tortured, murdered, raped, um, captured, hostages, and yet they're emerging in American universities as the heroes. Uh, they're emerging in the international community as heroes. Israel is being hurt. And if I were a Hamas leader, uh, an immoral Hamas leader, I would say, wow, uh, look at what we succeeded in doing. We killed all those Israelis. We raped all those women, which is part of Hamas's policy. And we got America to move away from Israel. And we got CNN to become one-sidedly against Israel. We got every major university in America to use their DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies against Israel. This was a great victory for Hamas. That can't be allowed to be done. And the Biden administration is moving in that direction. That's why I announced yesterday, I've never voted Republican in my life. I have voted for Democrats from the day I voted for John Kennedy in 1960. And I declared publicly yesterday that if the Biden administration in any way uh, begins to cut off any military aid, ammunition aid, anything else, that for me and many other supporters of Israel would be a red line. And I have an open mind now as to who I'm going to vote for in the coming election. If Biden continues to support Israel, that's one thing. But if he abandons Israel and gives Hamas a victory here, remember, he also correctly said, this is Biden, said if Putin is allowed a victory in Ukraine, he's moving to Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, Poland, who knows where. Uh, and, and, and of course, he should apply that to Hamas. If Hamas wins a victory, and they define victory only as hurting Israel, if Hamas wins a victory, it's coming to a theater near you. It's going to Europe. It's coming to America. And that's why Hamas must be defeated and dismantled and destroyed. And if there are civilian casualties, blame it on those who use human shields. And they're the only ones who can reduce human casualties. Right now, the ratio of civilians to combatants who are killed is lower than in any war in the history of urban warfare. At the worst, it's about 1.5 to 1. At best, it may be 1 to 1. No country has achieved that ratio of lower civilian deaths to combatant deaths. And yet you wouldn't know that from reading the New York Times, listening to CNN, or listening to academic lectures. Uh, people around the world think that Israel has exceeded other countries in the killing of civilians. It has not. It is much lower than countries, including the United States, Great Britain, and damn Canada. Damn Canada. Canada, the country that wouldn't allow a single Jew in in the Second World War, one Jew is too many, now becomes our first major ally to cut off aid uh, to Israel. Uh, I think Americans should begin to boycott uh, Canada. Uh, Canada has acted disgracefully and in a disgusting manner in this war, and shame on them. Yeah, Professor Dershowitz, how do we understand conceptually in terms of what Natan Sharansky called at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs in a dialogue the other day, the world is awash in moral confusion and needs more moral clarity. How do we understand that the worst act of genocide since the Nazi period that against Jews has refashioned Jews, not as the victims, but as the villains uh, well, I would... against the Hamas? How does that, how does the world, the, the West? The free world's consciousness, moral confusion, become kidnapped by this inversion of reality. Well, uh, I, I love Natan. He was my client. I represented him for eight years. I agree with him 98% of the time. I disagree with him here. There is no moral uh, confusion. They know what they're doing. They know that they don't care about the hunger that's going on in Sudan, the mini genocide that's going on in Sudan. They know they only care about Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people. There's no confusion there. There was no confusion when young people at the University of Munich marched for Hitler. And there is no confusion by governments and by the United Nations and by the world community. There's no confusion. They know what they're doing. They're going after Israel. They would never be satisfied until Israel is destroyed. Where there is a little confusion is among the useful idiots, these young, the Hitler youth, that are now marching at university campuses for Hamas from the river to the sea. They don't know which river, which sea. They have no idea. They're confused. They're being used as useful idiots. But the people who are running this and the governments, I guarantee you 
that the Prime Minister of Canada is not confused. He's making a cost-benefit decision, which is an immoral one. So I don't give them the benefit of confusion. I accuse them of, of, of moral hypocrisy and, uh, and, and of moral blindness, not confusion. And, and, and there are two answers. One, we have to continue to educate. Uh, I try to go around everywhere I can to speak and explain the history. That's number one. Number two, Israel must ignore the public opinion of the West. The, the West, major countries in the world are not your friends. Do not listen to them. And do not listen to the United States, except to the degree you have to, to get arms. Um, these are not your friends. Uh, you have to support your people. You have to defend your people. I gave an interview the other day to the Globes in Israel in which I warned that over the next 10 years, Israel must be ready for a possibility that the United States will not support Israel, that Joe Biden may be Israel's last democratic president that supports Israel. Israel must be prepared to go to this alone. It has to be prepared militarily. It has to be prepared economically. And it has to tell the world, look, and and, and the prime minister has said this, um, we come first. Uh, and, and we have to uh, uh, urge the world to understand that Israel is not going to listen to hypocritical public opinion. It's going to answer it. It's going to respond, even though CNN almost never gives Israel a chance to respond. It has that woman from Gaza who always exaggerates everything from the point of view of Hamas, and it rarely has Israeli spokesmen on. He does occasionally, but rarely. And 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 you have to be concerned. Israel ought to be looking inward uh, and not being so focused. And and I think the current administration is is doing that. It has to be less focused on politics. It's never going to win over university students and university professors. It's never going to win over Canada. Sorry. Canada is not doing this because it, it's concerned about human rights. If it were, it'd be focusing on Sudan, be focusing on other countries. It, it is concerned only for its own uh, political reaction. And that's what's happening in the United States, too. And I've warned President Biden, who I've known for 43 years, and who I like personally, you're making a dreadful mistake that's going to cost you this election. You're going to lose this election because you're too focused on Michigan. I know the joke in Israel is that Biden is very concerned about the two-state solution, the two states being Michigan and Minnesota, or Michigan and Pennsylvania, or Michigan and Nevada. But he's going to lose there. If he panders to the couple of hundred of thousand uh, Muslims and Arabs in, 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 in Michigan, who he'll never satisfy, no matter what he does, unless he calls for the complete extermination of Israel, he'll never satisfy that constituency. But if he panders to that constituency, he's going to lose Pennsylvania. He's going to lose Arizona. He's going to lose Nevada. He's going to lose definitely Florida. And 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 we have to make that clear. Uh, Americans who support Israel, not only American Jews, but American Christians as well. This is a fight. And this we have to we have to uh, be in a fighting mood and we have to fight back and we have to use all of our resources. Thankfully, we have a lot of people in America who have used their resources against American universities, people like Bill Ackman and, and others uh, who have done enormous good by getting rid of college presidents who have turned to uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, which is the most anti-Israel bureaucracy at American universities. Let me make one more point, and that is this. America is failing Israel because our leadership is abysmal. We have abysmal Jewish leadership in America. I am reminded of the days when our Jewish leadership was people who were pandering to Franklin Roosevelt, who were afraid to tell Franklin Roosevelt anything, including the man whose professorship I hold, Felix Frankfurter, who behaved disgracefully during the Second World War by refusing to bring to the attention of the president of the United States, the horrors of what was going on in the Holocaust, and the rabbis, the leading rabbis, uh, the rabbis from Temple Emanuel. Temple Emanuel, one of the worst institutions in Jewish history. It has always stood and pandered to the success of America's wealthy at the expense of Israel. And so we have to be concerned that American leaders, there are some great 
grassroots leaders in the United States in organizations like Chabad and Stand With Us and Camera. But the major Jewish leadership in America has failed Israel and continues to fail Israel. It cares more about preserving its status as you have to like us. You have to make sure we're not provoking you. Uh, and, you know, we've seen this. We saw this in the Holocaust with Bergman and others who were rejected in the name of uh, Abba Hillel Silva, who did do nothing to help Jews during uh, the Second World War. And many other pretend uh, leaders of the Jewish community who were more concerned about their status than they were about about Israel. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> Schumer thinks Israel needs a change in, in leadership. I believe America needs a change in Jewish leadership, and it's not happening. And that's why those of us who care deeply have to use all of our resources to fight back. Professor Dershowitz, I'm holding up a copy of your latest book, and, and, and knowing you as I have since I was a student at Harvard in the early 1980s, uh, when you actually uh, led about 30 embattled young Harvard Jewish Hillel students out of a PLO meeting with what was then the Black Students Associ a Law School uh, uh, Association, uh, you've, uh, you've always taken uh, the, the road less traveled, you worked against the current, and within weeks of the October 7th massacre, you came out with this book, which is called War Against the Jews, How to End Hamas Barbarism. I, I want to uh, discuss this with you and 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 Maurice. Is this a war, in your view, against the Jews? It's not a war against Israel, per se. And to what degree, uh, as we're discussing here at the JCPA, this is a war against the free world. It's a war against the West. I wish I had called it, instead of the war against the Jews, the war against civilization, the war against the West. Israel, as often has been the case, and has often been the case with Jews, stand for the civilization, Western civilization, and Hamas stands for the destruction of Western civilization. On the day this happened, October 7th, I woke up in the morning, I was about to go to shul, it was Shabbos, and uh, Pikuach Nefesh, uh, I decided instead to sit down and write a book. And I got the book written within 30 days, and it was published within 60 days. Uh, and um, uh, I, if I were 25 years old, I would have gotten on a plane, and, and, and been in Gaza fighting for the Jewish people. I'm 85 years old. And so for me, the pen is not only mightier than the sword, it's the only weapon I have. And so I'm continuing to write op-eds and to speak, but I've been canceled at a lot of places. Um, the 92nd Street Y in New York has canceled me. The Ramaz School has canceled me. The uh, Cardoza Law School, uh, students wanted me to speak about Israel at Cardoza Law School, part of Yeshiva University. And the dean of Cardoza Law School said, no, Dershowitz is too controversial. Um, and uh, Temple Emanuel has canceled me. Uh, many other uh, established Jewish uh, uh, organizations have canceled me because although for, for, for Israelis, I'm right in the middle. I actually favor ultimately, ultimately not now, not as a reward for Hamas, but some degree of Palestinian autonomy in a state which is disarmed and peaceful I'm a moderate when it comes to Israeli politics. I am not a supporter of, 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 of Smetrich and, 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 and the right wing in the Israeli government. But for American universities, I'm too extreme. Um, when I speak, if I manage to speak at an American university, I need armed guards uh, to protect me. There is violence. There are threats. Um, I have a thick skin. I can stand up to that. But many, many Jewish students today are terrified and will not wear a kippah and certainly won't wear the symbol of America and Israel uh, together. In fact, when I wear this, and I wear it all over, and I wear my tie, usually when I wear a tie, it says, I'm Yisrael Chai. Uh, friends and relatives say, take that off, you're going to get beaten up. Well, I'm too old to worry about that. But the uh, American, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, authorities at universities have an obligation to promote speech from all points of view, and we're not hearing two sides of the issue. At American universities. I cannot speak at Harvard today after 60 years of association with Harvard, teaching 10,000 students. I am essentially banned at my own university, at Harvard University. Oh, I can speak about abortion. Sure. I can speak about uh, gun control. 
but I cannot speak about Israel. I will not be invited. Students at Berkeley invited me recently to speak, but the administration hasn't accepted that. At MIT the other day, they accepted a speaker who was pro-Hamas and who glorified October 7th, and they rejected Dennis Ross. They said, he's too radical. Dennis Ross? My God, he's the guy who sent all the cement to Gaza uh, for humanitarian purposes when he was in the Obama administration, which were used to build the tunnels. Dennis is the most moderate uh, person, two-state solution person, and he's now too radical for MIT as being pro-Israel. It's really turned around, but it's not moral confusion. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's immoral behavior, clear immoral behavior. So maybe you can help us uh, understand that a little bit, uh, 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 Professor Dershowitz. We have on the one side the worst massacre carried out against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. In any other circumstances, that would generally generate quite a substantial amount of sympathy. And yet here what we're seeing is the exact opposite. Whilst initially supportive, the Biden administration seems to be now really abandoning Israel, um, forcing on us um, even Qatar into this floating port into the into the Mediterranean Sea to bring aid to Gaza. Really, Qatar is the Muslim Brotherhood, is Hamas, that they're bringing the Satan into our own house and saying, you now have to live with them. And what, what, what are we missing there? Where has that change happened along the way? This would seem to be counterintuitive when the Saudis look out on what the, the administration is now doing to Israel, abandoning its ally, long-term ally. What would the Saudis be thinking long-term? Should I set my lot with America and the West? Or should I set my lot with Iran and the axis of evil? Where does that seem to be going wrong? That's a, you're exactly you're exactly right. Look, there are several groups that you have to distinguish. On October 8th, which was one of the worst days after October 7th, the National Lawyers Guild, the second largest bar association in America, a hard left organization, uh, issued a statement saying that Hamas was correct in doing what they did. They were justified under international law, basically praising Hamas. 33 groups at Harvard, including Amnesty International at Harvard, blamed Israel. This is before Israel sent a single soldier into Gaza. So that's phase one, October 8th, 9th, 10th, in the beginning, when the true bigot anti-Semites, many of them old line communists, old line anarchists, socialists, people who use any opportunity on the hard right to try to destroy alliances like those between Israel and the United States. That's the first group. The second group uh, were those who, uh, uh, as soon as Israel sent troops in, uh, uh, changed sides. They were sympathetic initially, but they ceased to be uh, uh, sympathetic. And then the third group are those that fall for these phony statistics, who honestly believe, and maybe they are confused, maybe it's appropriate for this group, uh, who believe that Israel is engaged in a war of genocide. Um, I have children of friends of mine, dear friends of mine, who are very supportive of Israel, but their children and their grandchildren absolutely believe Israel is engaged in genocide, that it's targeting babies, that it's deliberately killing people, that it's deliberately creating a famine. And that's the other massive, massive uh, misinformation about famine in Gaza. We have been hearing the cry of wolf, the cry of famine in Gaza for more than five months now, from literally from the time this all began. There was no famine in Gaza. And if there is hunger in Gaza today, it's not that there's not enough food. It's that the food is being misallocated. It's that Hamas is stealing the food that it's preventing food from coming uh, uh, through. In Sudan, there's real hunger, real starvation, real malnutrition, a real famine. Nobody cares about that. The important point is that these people don't really, the enemies of Israel don't care as much about supporting the Palestinians as they do about opposing Israel. Uh, Israel has become a pariah of the left. It used to be the darling of the left. But once the Communist Party and the Soviet Union switched in the early to mid uh, 60s, before the 67 war, the American Communist Party shifted, uh, Noam Chomsky shifted, Norman Finkelstein shifted, all the hard, hard left anarchist uh, groups uh, shifted, and Israel became the pariah of the world. And, and so the Palestinians 
were lucky because their alleged oppressors were Jews. And so the world gathered around them without caring really about any groups. These are not human rights activists. These are people who are selective. These are people who pick and choose. Um, and that includes, as I said, Physicians Without Doctors Without Borders, which is a despicable organization that uses the fact that it has some doctors, many of the people are not doctors who are in it, uh, and uses the fact that uh, there are doctors to oppose Israel. It's the same thing as the Jewish Voice for Peace, which is central to many of these many of these um, uh, protests. They're not Jewish. The Jewish Voice for Peace is not a Jewish organization. Many of its members, perhaps even most, are not Jewish. They just figured it out. If they can use the word Jewish, the media will assume, and some of them were Talay Talay Tim, some of them were Tzitzit, some of them were Kippah. They're not Jewish. They're, they're many of them are Protestant and, and other Christian religions. They're not Jewish, but they use the word Jewish, and they they succeed. And the propaganda mill has worked very, very, very well, and has succeeded in getting these useful idiots, these young kids, these uh, Hitler youth, uh, to march. You know, people forget. Hitler came to power largely through the influence of university students and university professors. Stalin, Castro, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, the worst tyrants in the world had young people supporting them. And so you can't give these 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds a pass. They are villains. They are evil people when they support Hamas and oppose Israel. The hard thing is there are grandchildren, there are great nieces and nephews, there are friends' grandchildren. And so it's hard to oppose them in the way we could oppose if only they were uh, people who uh, uh, are members of Hamas. But these are fellow travelers who um, uh, uh, support Hamas out of ignorance or out of hatred for Israel, sometimes just self-hatred of the Jewish people. There's a lot of that going on now, too, on university campuses. I hear it from my students and I hear it from my friends who say a lot of Jews use this as an opportunity to go after their parents, um, to get revenge on their uh, rabbis, to um, show the self-hatred that they have toward the Jewish people. And many of them are joining this demonstration. Let me make one prediction. If the war is over, if, if there could be a ceasefire, and of course Israel is proposed and agreed on a ceasefire, and Hamas hasn't agreed on its terms. If there's a ceasefire, these demonstrations will not stop. The demonstrations are not about a ceasefire. There isn't a single sign in a single demonstration that I've ever seen that calls for a two-state solution, that calls for a Palestinian state. They're not interested in that. These demonstrations are opposed to Israel's existence. One in five, one in five college students, according to a poll recently published, one in five American college students will not associate or be friendly with any other college student that supports the right of Israel to exist. So forget about what's going on in Gaza, to exist. This has become, in terms of public relations, existential. It's not about a ceasefire. It's not about Gaza. It's about Jerusalem. It's about Tel Aviv. It's about Israel. And Professor Dershowitz, if we if we zoom out for a minute, it's not about October 7th either. It was about the Oslo Agreement. The Oslo Agreement, it turns out, evidentially, is the most catastrophic process that Israel had engaged in and, and because what it did, it legitimized the PLO, whose charter, whose dedication, whose public declarations were to destroy the Jewish state. And I would argue as a former student of yours, that that we were willingly blind to a process that led to October 7th, that looked like a process of mutual acceptance, of mutual legitimacy, of mutual goodwill to establish a Palestinian state. And what ended up happening was in Israel's earnestness and desperation for peace, we legitimized what ended up becoming a monster that rejected Israel's existence and that resulted in October 7th, it didn't begin on October 7th. What's your sense? Reasonable people can disagree about that. I think reasonable people can disagree about the Oslo Accords. Um, I sat down with a boss over dinner uh, a few years ago and he said to me over dinner, why don't you call your friend Benjamin Netanyahu 
and ask him to recognize uh, a Palestinian state. And I said, I'll make that call if you will say the following words. I recognize Israel as a legitimate Jewish state. He said, I can never do that. I said, what if you were to say, I recognize Israel as a legitimate nation state of the Jewish people? And he said, well, maybe someday. And then uh, Saeed Arakat punched him in the, in the belly, basically, and said, no, don't say that. Um, uh, <laughs> and I didn't make the call. Look, I think the big disaster is something that I mostly supported, and that it's not the uh, it's not the um, Oslo Accords. It was my friend, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Ariel Sharon, abandoning Gaza. I had he he called me into the, his office to tell me about it before it happened, and I said to him, I thought he was right in uh, ending the civilian settlements. Uh, I'm not a fan of civilian settlements. I thought he was right in ending the civilian settlements in Gaza, but wrong in ending the military occupation. Uh, and the world has to understand there's an enormous distinction in law and policy and, and in military strategy between civilian settlements on the one hand and military occupation. Under international law, a military occupation can continue as long as there's any resistance, as long as there's any military resistance. Israel had a perfect right to remain in Gaza with its military, uh, though I don't think it should have kept uh, civilians there. Um, and um, I have the same views about the, the West Bank. Look, everything's changed and uh, there is a reality on the ground. But uh, uh, the Palestinians have to take responsibility for the fact that in 2000, 2001, they were offered a state on 90 something percent of the West Bank in 2007 under Prime Minister Omer. They were offered, I think, 98 percent with a capital in Jerusalem. And they turned it down and uh, or they didn't respond positively in the into the Omer plan. And so to the extent that there are complaints about an occupation, and again, I distinguish between civilian and military, the occupation, the continued occupation is entirely the fault of the Palestinian leadership. I listened to the, the Queen of Jordan the other day on CNN give, being given an opportunity to put forth her garbage and her anti-Semitic uh, nonsense without any hard questions or any responses. And she was railing about the occupation. And the CNN analyst didn't even say to her, by the way, you know who's responsible for the occupation, and that is King Hussein. King Hussein had an opportunity in 1967 not to enter the war, and Israel said they wouldn't even even capture the, the holiest place in Judaism, the Kotel. They certainly wouldn't have gone into the West Bank. And, and King Hussein fired rockets into West Jerusalem, uh, a, a war crime. And only then did Israel uh, occupy the West Bank, uh, the West Bank, which had been illegally occupied previously by Jordan. But people don't know that history. And CNN won't confront the Queen of Jordan with the responsibility of Jordan, nor did he mention that Jordan killed more Palestinians than Israel has uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in Black September. The world simply doesn't have a context, and and the media is failing to present that context, and you don't want to hear it. When I speak on these things and mention these things, I get booed. It's okay, uh, but it's true. And uh, so you can argue about the Oslo Accords. You can argue about the leaving of Gaza. The reality is that, in the end, uh, probably the least worst solution is going to be disengagement between Israel and the Arab populations of Gaza and, and the West Bank. What form that disengagement takes and what form um, uh, any kind of polity uh, that includes the Palestinian people takes is difficult. Look, when you go to Ramallah, I've been to Ramallah, Ramallah is a Palestinian state and there are no Israeli soldiers, there are no Israeli troops. They take out their own garbage, they pay their own taxes, they vote for their own people. And yet, look what they did a few years ago, uh, lynched two Israeli soldiers who by accident uh, got there and they, the red hand that was put at the window to signify the lynching of these two young Israeli, I think teenagers or young 20s, this, this red hand has now become the symbol that was worn by so many Hollywood uh, stars and Hollywood directors uh, during the uh, Oscars uh, to great applause after a despicable um, uh, British Jew uh, talked about uh, how here we stand 
uh, rejecting our Jewishness and the Holocaust and not allowing it to be used as an excuse for an occupation. What kind of a comparison is that? And so, you know, we're fighting Hollywood, we're fighting academia. And that's why I'm somewhat pessimistic. You know, in, in Israel, they say a pessimist is someone who says things can't get any worse. An optimist says, yes, they can. <laughs> I'm an, uh, only because I see the young people, the Hollywood people, the university people, they're our biggest enemies today. And they are the future because 10 years from now, 15 years from now, these Harvard students and MIT students um, will be in Congress. The saving grace, the cause of optimism, is the pro-Israel community at colleges and universities has never been more united. Uh, they are sticking together. And some great organizations like Chabad on campus um, uh, are really encouraging them. And so, um, you know, this is this is a battle and we have to show support for uh, for Israel. I've made another pledge. I used to give a lot of money. Uh, we're very charitable in my family to the Metropolitan Opera and to the museums and to Harvard. Uh, and to Yale, where I went to law school and to Brooklyn College, I've cut off all of my personal contributions to any organizations except those that support Israel. And 100% uh, of all my contributions now go to pro-Israel causes. I've signed on to this new promise um, of leaving, um, I think it's a third or a quarter of my estate um, uh, that I give to charity to Israel. Uh, this is the time for un, if ain on the im ain anili mili. We have for so many generations been at the forefront of helping the African American community, many of which turned against us, helping the gay community, many of whom turned against us, helping the women's community. Me too, except if you're a Jew. We have to start demanding of groups that we support that they support us. I'm not going to be contributing to these organizations. I've terminated my support for the American Civil Liberties Union and for other organizations that have turned against uh, Israel. Uh, and I think that Jews all over the world have to begin looking inward and realize this is a time of crisis and this is a time to defend Israel and the Jewish people around the world. We are in danger. When you have a, a Professor Dershowitz on, on the campuses, such a, a toxic situation where where Jewish students are really afraid to walk around. They're afraid to identify, as you described it, identify as being Jewish. That's something which in America, I think, is, is, is really unprecedented. It shouldn't be the situation that is prevalent on any university campus, but it's something which is the, 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 the October 7 massacre seems to have brought out the most venomous anti-Semitism I think ever experienced by, uh, uh, by the United States. And, and really, that's the product of, of, of what we're seeing, that all of these organizations, many of them that we were supportive of before, have now turned against us. How do we avoid that in the future? Is there any way back to finding that common ground? Or is that a time, are we really living the 1930s again in America, in Europe, um, towards its really uh, um, disastrous consequences? We're not. And we're not because of one word, uh, Israel. If Israel had existed in the 1930s, we wouldn't have had the Holocaust. And Israel exists today and is strong. And and um, it will make it impossible for there to be a repetition of the 1930s. But what we're seeing is a repetition of some of the elements in the 1930s that led to the toleration of anti-Semitism by so many uh, Germans. And people always put the blame on, on the Germans, the Belgians, the uh, the 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 Dutch, uh, the French, um, uh, they were complicit. Um, virtually the whole uh, Western Europe was complicit in, in in the Holocaust, and of course Eastern Europe was worse because they participated. Ukraine and and Poland and 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 Latvia and Lithuania, um, but there was no fighting back. Today there is fighting back. There's fighting back both by Israel. And by those of us in America uh, who um, are willing to put our reputations and our fortunes uh, at stake to fight back. And, 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 and we are. And we have to use our strength, our economic strength, our political strength, our moral strength. And people ask me all the time, uh, are, you, are you playing into the dual loyalty notion? No, no, I love America. But uh, it's Israel that's in danger now. I love Israel. And Israel, it's in danger now. And we have to put our priorities 
in that direction. And so uh, what we need is a leadership in the Jewish community that's not afraid to fight back, not afraid to cut off funding, not afraid to bring lawsuits. We are bringing lawsuits now all over the country. Um, some great law firms um, are leading our, our lawsuits. We've started a little organization uh, of lawyers called Hurt a Jew, We Sue You. And um, we have lawyers, Christians, Jews, that are prepared uh, to fight back uh, and, 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 and bring lawsuits and, and use legislation and use our political power. Remember, the vast majority of American Christians support Israel. It, I think perhaps today the support among American Christians may be more universal than in, among at least some elements of, uh, of reform Jewry, the Temple Emmanuel type Jews, um, who when Israel is a source of pride, they say, oh, we're Israeli. They pound their chests after the 67 war. And as soon as Israel becomes a source of possible criticism among their elite friends, uh, they turn against Israel. The Temple Emanuel Jew has been a source of terrible problems for the Jewish community throughout its history, from the time it opposed the establishment of Israel, because as the German Jews uh, uh, said, many of them, the elitist Jews, many of them who have law firms named after them today, what do we have to do with the Jews of Europe? They have nothing in common with us. We have to care about preserving our status as upper class American Jews, elitist Jews, that's Temple Emmanuel Jews. And we have to fight against them as strongly as we fight against um, uh, other, other enemies of the Jewish people in Israel. Fortunately, we have real Jews in organizations like uh, Chabad and Stand With Us and Camera and, 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 and the lawfare, anti-lawfare projects. Um, and and we're, we're, we're kind of establishing a new Jewish leadership grassroot Jewish leadership that is doing a good job in, in fighting back, not only against our enemies, but against those who claim to be our friends, the Chuck Schumers, the Temple Emanuels, those who put their own status before the future of the Jewish people and the future of Israel. Professor Dershowitz, just to, to uh, uh, a last question here, Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs um, has for some time, certainly before the massacres and more intensively since October the 7th, been engaging with uh, Israeli Arabs who work here at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Khaled Abu Tuame is a senior staff member and scholar here at the JCP and um, Arab countries throughout the region who actually support Israel and are baffled by the West and the and the American uh, uh, continued pressure, which they believe will bring Hamas and Iranian assaults upon them and completely destabilize the region. How effective do you think it is for the JCPA to bring its Arab colleagues to America by Zoom or live in order to intensify, enhance and the engagement uh, uh, with our friends uh, where you are in New York and across the United States. Idea, particularly if you can get young people and some women and some others uh, who young people might listen to. Uh, right now, many of the young people who are marching do not have open minds. They have open mouths, but closed minds. But I think that we have to be prepared for a time, maybe after there is a ceasefire, maybe after there is something like a sensation of the current war, to begin to educate uh, young people to the fact that great organizations like yours are reaching out and extending hands of, of peace to um, Arab neighbors and Muslim neighbors. Uh, you know, show you how things have changed. When Arafat died, uh, groups of Palestinians, including uh, students for Justice for Palestine, uh, they wanted to have a demonstration and they wanted to have the Palestinian flag fly in Harvard Yard and the Harvard authorities wouldn't allow them to. Who do you think they came to to be their lawyer? Me, I represented them. Uh, I said, I have a deal. I'll represent you free to get you to be able to have a memorial service for Arafat, but you have to allow me to distribute my leaflets at the demonstration, and they did. And I distributed leaflets showing what a Har Arafat had been. And the heading of the leaflet was, Arafat died an untimely death. If he had only died four years earlier, there might've been peace in a two-state solution. And so we had freedom of speech. They were able to demonstrate in favor of Arafat. I was able to demonstrate, along with some other people, against Arafat 
today that climate doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the Jewish students do not have free speech on campus. The Jewish students do not have equal rights on campus. And we have to fight back. And, and your wonderful organization, which has done so much good in so many different contexts, can play a major role and, and, and certainly a major role in, in, in a time when there's vacuum among Jewish leaders in, in the United States. We, we can use um, creative, effective leadership from Israel, and your organization is one of the best to provide that. So again, I thank you for allowing me this forum, uh, and I hope that you will uh, send this uh, interview uh, widely around so people can see your views, my views, and understand the depths of the problem that we face um, in America and in Israel and around the world, and to make sure that we never see a repetition of the 1930s. And again, the most important guarantor of that is the strength of Israel. You know, the psalmist says, Hashem Ozli Amo Yitain, Hashem Yivarechet Amo B'Shalom. God will give the Jewish people oh, strength, and only then will they get peace. The Jewish people have long ago learned the only way to get peace is through strength. Don't beg for it. Don't plead for it. The world loves dead Jews. They love Holocaust memorials, um, but they don't love strong Jews, and they don't love Jews that fight back, and that's what we are, and that's what we have to be. And the only way to secure victory and to secure the stability of Israel and the Jewish community is through strength. So chazak ve'amatz. Let's continue to work together with strength uh, toward a resolution of this a uh, terrible, terrible crisis that we face today. In the words then of of, of, of the late uh, uh, great Menachem Begin to, to Senator Biden, I am not a Jew with a trembling knees. I am a Jew with a 3,500-year-old history. Proud, I will stand up and fight back. Thank you, uh, Professor Dershowitz. Uh, you talked about the moral clarity of our adversaries, and we have to say there also you helped us with moral clarity of our greatest advocates and that. Uh, that would be you, sir. Professor Alan Dershowitz, the author of the latest War Against the Jews and so many uh, scores of other books, former professor of mine at Harvard University and a great teacher and mentor for us all. Thank you ever so much for joining us at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs Wartime Diplomacy Update and Analysis. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate what you do and you're up giving me an opportunity to state what I do. Thank you. See you soon, Professor Dershowitz. Thank you. Keep well. You too.